Thank you very much, John, and also thank you very much to UCD for hosting uh, this event this evening. Um, so welcome also on behalf of the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. And um, a number of years ago, well, 1966 to be precise, uh, J.L. Singh, who was then professor of uh, theoretical physics in the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, asked himself the question, what would it be like to be close to a black hole and what would you see? What would light do? And uh, he wrote a paper back then in 1966. Um, he worked on what we call stationary black holes, so black holes that are not rotating. But he came up with this idea, which you'll see, I think, this evening in, in the talk, about the shadow of a black hole. Uh, a few years later, then, another physicist, uh, Bardeen, came up with the solution for what we call a rotating black hole. And I imagine our speaker will say, tell you a little bit about that this evening. But also in 1966, our speaker was born. <laughs> and uh, fast forward many, many years to last year, and we saw, of course, the amazing pictures, the first pictures of a black hole, M87, and uh, what it actually looked like. And this involved an enormous collaboration between uh, the US and Europe to get that particular image, an enormous amount of work. So it's really a delight to introduce our speaker this evening, Professor Heino, Falke from Randboud University in the Netherlands. Uh, he started off, I think, doing his doctorate in, in Germany. He spent uh, uh, some time then in, uh, in the US and eventually ended up, as, as I said, back in the Netherlands. But he led um, a, a big consortium called the Event Horizon Telescope, which received a lot of uh, funding from the European Research Council to, to try and produce this first image of a black hole. So I think it, it's, it's fitting because the, the Institute did this uh, early work on black holes and what they would look like that um, Professor uh, Falke this evening tells us the story of M87 and the first image of a black hole. So thank you very much. Thank you so much to have me here tonight uh, to talk with you about sort of our adventure. Um, and I must admit, I hadn't noticed that paper you mentioned until you told me this afternoon, but I think I'm excused because I was born after it was written. So <laughs> I wasn't up to date with the liter literature at the time. Um, and it's just in hindsight that you discover that how many things were done before you and, and sometimes were, were sort of you know, forgotten because they were too early for their time in, in a way. Uh, and you're right, so this is a, a collaboration, what I am talking about here. It started out with sort of a ideas of a few people, but you know, it grew up to a big collaboration. We were funded significantly by the European Research Council, where our synergy grant is for 14 million euros given to us in uh, 2014. This was a, the single biggest la uh, grant uh, for the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, and made very significant contributions together with Luciano Rizzola and Michael Krama. We received this grant, um, and you know, it was called Black Hole Cam. The Event Horizon Telescope Consortium was, was in the making for even a longer time and uh, consisted of 13 institutions, of which one of the Radboud University was one of them in Europe. We have these four European ones, four American uh, institutions. Uh, Canada, Mexico, and some Asians, but also lots of colleagues from other uh, countries as well, which were not affiliated with one of these stakeholder institutions. You see here a picture from the, um, in fact, the first collaboration meeting that we had, because we were formed in 2017 only when we signed the Memorandum of Understanding, uh, and that was actually after we did our first observation. It took so long, sometimes felt like United Nations to have all these negotiations to get to such an international uh, agreement. Uh, but here everybody was smiling uh, and happy because they already knew the results. That was in November 2018, our first uh, 
and uh, till the collaboration, also the last collaboration, uh, till the, the publication, the last collaboration meeting, uh, and that's where we hashed out a lot of the, the details of the papers and, and looked at the first images. Uh, that was still very secretive at the time because uh, some journalists wanted to find out what the results are and everybody wanted to know. And so our American friends suggested we tape all the windows so that nobody could see, but you know, we were not quite as paranoid and, uh, and you know, kept on going. Because you know, nobody knows in the end what is the right image, what is the simulation. For, you, know, you, you have to know the story behind it to know what's, uh, what's, what is right. Um, well, just you know, a short introduction, of course, to our understanding of space and time. Why, why is it called the Event Horizon Telescope? Why is it so important? I think we're talking about something that's fundamentally important. It's space and time. This, this is where the theater, the drama of, of, of our history, of our universe actually unfolds. It, it unfolds in, in space and time. Um, and uh, if you know in the, you know, era before Einstein, you know, Newton came up with this wonderful theory of, of gravity, which was very uh, beautifully working, describing the laws of the, the, the motion of the planets. Um, and in his view, uh, and the view of, of everybody, space is absolute, time is absolute, it exists, it doesn't change. Um, and gravity was a force at the time. And the, the story goes that you know, Newton was thinking about the apple falling down, and there would be a force pulling it towards the Earth. Uh, and that force would fall off with uh, the distance squared. And that was you know, working wonderfully. Until these pesky astronomers were measuring something weird in the 19th century, namely that the orbit of Mercury was not quite following the laws of, of Newton. Um, and Maxwell was describing the laws of uh, light um, of how light would propagate and also had weird properties. Namely, if you look at it, it looked like the velocity of light would not depend on the observer. Uh, it would always be the same. Uh, and it was, you know, keep, get people scratching their heads. And the person that scratched the most was Albert Einstein, of course. And he changed the way we were looking at space and time and gravity. It all became one. Um, gravity was the result of the curvature of space and time uh, due to mass and energy concentrated in whatever configuration. Um, and so if you picture space and time as a two-dimensional surface, as uh, so you have a two-dimensional world, you actually have a mass that will actually, you know, you have like a, a big um, a trampoline or so, and you put a, a big mass in the center, you'll have a little funnel there. And that's how you have to picture space and time. And if you roll a, uh, a ball, a bowling ball or so, along this uh, flat surface, it will go straight until it actually you know, will feel the curvature of, of, of space, and it will go around and follow that, that, that curvature. Um, and if there is no friction, that ball can rotate for all eternity. Okay? You know, we, don't, we have friction here, so if you have a ball in, in, in a funnel like this, it will actually uh, become uh, uh, get lower energy and will actually uh, go down that uh, that funnel and disappear. But if you have no friction, it can go on. Now the other consequence is if space and time is curved, um, light will also not go on straight lines. Um, light will have to bend and follow the shortest path through the uh, through space, uh, and the shortest path sometimes can make can mean uh, you take a turn. And uh, that would mean that light would have to bend. And that was one of the first and important predictions of, of Einstein. In fact, the light bending it was already predicted. You, know, you could predict it in the theory of, 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 of Newton. But in Einstein, it was actually a stronger effect. And uh, that effect of light bending was first proven. Well, the first thing that Einstein was actually able to resolve was this orbit of Mercury. Uh, and the second thing was in 1919, the famous Eddington expedition, which actually saw the light bending of stars that were shifting their position uh, due to the position of the sun. And that was uh, pictures taken during a solar eclipse. And that was a big breakthrough of uh, general relativity. And as I just learned today, the original equipment is actually here in Dublin uh, and, uh, and to, to be seen uh, in your observatory here. The other consequence of this light bending is, and yeah, so the other fundamental statement that Einstein made was that light always propagates indeed with the same speed, 
independent of where you are as an observer. For every observer, light moves always at the same speed. Sounds strange, but it's measured. And uh, means that the fundamental constant is not space and time, but is light. Because light actually measures everything. Everything we measure, more or less, is measured through light. Uh, and so space doesn't exist on its own. We only see its effects by seeing how light propagates, what light does. Um, and time, we only measure by something else e e developing. Uh, light, time is not a quantity of its own. It's, it's always something that follows from uh, the evolution of physics. And almost all information and all forces are exchanged at the speed of light. Okay? Even if you, hit, you know, if you hit someone with a hammer on the, on the head, you know, uh, it, it will be at the lowest level, it will be sort of an interaction, electromagnetic interaction between the uh, atoms in the hammer and the atoms in the head. Uh, and that will propagate with the speed of light. Of course, it will be much slower uh, and much more painful than if you hit with a, with, with a, with a laser pointer. But um, it, it, at the lowest level, this information, I'm being hit by a hammer, propagates with the speed of light. Um, and, and, and so that changes really the way we think. Um, it also changes the way we think about time. You can use light, light is waves. Um, and so you can use light as the most basic and simplest clock you can think of by just looking at the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the vibrations of, of, of light, the, the, the waves of light. And so if you, if you do this, um, and then you go around curved space-time. What happens here? You have to suddenly go a longer, a longer path now. Okay? You go a longer path, it usually would take a longer time. Um, to do this, and um, or if you want to do it at the same time, you'd have to go faster. But what happens here is speed of light is always the same. So you go here with the same speed through space. Um, you have a longer path length, so if you get the same speed uh, as a longer length, you also need a longer time. So time also needs to change as the length will change. You know, the, the length of, of space changes, then the length of, of time needs to change as well to go through it with the same speed of, speed of light. Okay, that's how you would, would measure it. And so you would predict that speed of light goes somewhat slower here uh, as you are in the curved space-time. And in fact, this is what we measure today. If you use your cell phone, uh, use GPS, uh, then uh, the, the clocks that you measure are on a satellite and they go 38 microseconds per day faster than here on Earth simply because of that effect. You all, all of you use that every day and you wouldn't arrive here um, if, you, if you wouldn't know where that uh, nice building is if you rely on navigation because you'd be off by tens of kilometers. We had some discussion whether it's 10 or 50 kilometers this afternoon, but tens of kilometers um, after, after one, one day. So uh, these effects you know, are very subtle and are measured. Of course, you can go further, uh, and you can have more mass crammed into a smaller space. And the more you do this, the stronger is the force of gravity near that object, because you have more mass there. Um, and um, also the curvature is, is stronger. And if you want to keep on a stable orbit, actually you have to go faster to not fall into sort of that, uh, that funnel. And the closer you get to a gravitating object, you faster have to rotate. And we know this from the planets, of course. Yeah, Mercury has to go much faster than the Earth uh, in order to have the centrifugal force balanced the gravitational attraction, talking Newtonian now. So the closer you get to an object, the faster your orbit has to be. And you can actually describe that by a simple formula, which says sort of the, the, the motion here uh, that, that you, you have to go around um, is uh, given by square root of the rotation constant times the mass divided by the radius, which means the smaller the radius is for a given mass, the higher the speed that you need to have in order to go around. Now, that means the closer you get, the higher the velocity. At some point, the velocity becomes the speed of light. C here stands for the speed of light. And so it happens at a characteristic radius. You know, if you, if you solve this for the speed of light, the radius given by G times the mass divided by 
the speed of light squared. So what happens there? Well, the object would go on, uh, you know, with the speed of light. Well, that can be because nothing, no matter, can go with the speed of light. Only light can go with the speed of light. Everything else has to go slow. That means at this point, when you reach that high of a rotational speed or a high escape speed, uh, something breaks. Not the object, but physics seems to break. And that was a big worrying factor for uh, the early physicists. Now what happens to light? If light enters this region, uh, and it would want to escape again, like in the case before, it would have to go out with a speed faster than the speed of light once it has crossed that region. Okay, light cannot go faster than itself. Yeah, and nothing can go faster than light, and every information is transferred maximally with the speed of light. That means everything that crosses that region can never get out again. Light cannot get out, no information, no matter can get out. And that's why it's called the event horizon, because you know, every event uh, that happens inside cannot transport any information about itself outside. It, you know, whatever happens inside stays inside. That's a black hole rule, okay? Um, and uh, that's a fascinating region, because it means if that exists, uh, there's a certain part of the universe that exists, it's sort of a, a sphere, so to speak, in, uh, in space. You can go in, but you can never find out what's inside. Okay. Now, um, well, also, if you look at time, actually time will also be stretched to almost infinity. So if you look from the outside, it will look like time will come to a standstill at this event horizon. Another bizarre uh, effect. What happens if you, well, how, how big is this, uh, the size of this object if you, if you have one? So uh, the radius would be about uh, one and a half to three kilometers uh, for an object the size of the sun. It could be if you have 100 million suns combined, compressed into a region of 150 million kilometers, then you'd also have an event horizon forming. 150 million kilometers is the size of the, the, the size of the Earth's orbit. So if you have 100 billion suns in the solar system, you would have this effect. You would say, that's all crazy, this doesn't happen. Well, nature actually thinks differently, it does happen. How does it happen? Well, you can have a small black hole, and we call it a black hole, obviously. Uh, when a star explodes, the inner parts collapse, and the gravitational attraction becomes so strong that no force can keep the collapse. And so that's how you can form a small black hole of a few kilometers. And then you can go to the centers of Milky Ways, where you have millions of stars and more, and these produce black holes again. And they can collapse to a big black hole. And that big black hole can only grow all the time scale of the universe. Black holes in our universe cannot get smaller. They will always just secrete, become bigger, not smaller. Um, and that means um, you can reach very, very large masses, at least in principle. Now, quick uh, thought of what happens if you are nearing a black hole. Uh, assume you are this happy face uh, to the side, and you are, you are approaching a small black hole. And you get close enough, you're actually accelerating to the speed of light, which is nothing, no problem. It's actually fine, because you are in free space. You're falling with the speed of light, no problem. But if you get to the strong curvature regime means your, uh, the curvature of space is actually visible, of, you feel it across your body, okay? Your feet are more attracted than your head, which means uh, as you approach the black hole, you're being stretched and spaghettified. And that's sort of an unpleasant way of entering a black hole, which means you're not gonna see what you wanna see, namely the event horizon, okay? So the trick is, if you really wanna do the one-way trip, uh, and, and make it through the event horizon, you have to go to a big black hole. Because then you're like a tiny little cell, right? You're a little, like a little human cell compared to the Buckingham Palace, if, if I you know, may, may use that example. You probably have equally nice buildings here in Dublin. Um, and then the curvature is actually small, uh, and you can actually fall safely into a black hole. Now, do black holes exist? The idea uh, came about in, uh, in the... 
uh, 60s, people realized, yes, they can form through prolapse. That is, in principle, possible. And then this, in the late 60s, the early 70s, quasars were discovered. Very bright uh, objects at billions of light years away. And uh, the energy came from a region smaller than this, uh, the solar system. And how can you get so much energy? Well, you can get so much, so much energy if you let matter fall onto a black hole. It will accelerate to the speed of light. It will rotate. It will have to get rid of some of its energy. And it can radiate enormous amount of energies. Now, throwing 10 buckets of water into a black hole uh, would give you enough energy for the, to, to get the entire Netherlands, probably also Ireland, uh, run on energy of all forms of energy for an entire year, right? Just 10 buckets of water. So you, you guys are insanely rich, you know, being an island, um, if, if you manage to make a black hole, of course. So there are always two is. Uh, and then in the 90s, people actually looked at the center of galaxies. People were saying, okay, if, if, there, are, if there are quasars, black holes far out in the universe, they should be there still today. They were looking at the center of galaxies, and they realized that in the, in the nuclear of galaxies, there, there are some dark regions, some dark mass um, that uh, is, is, is there that we don't really see. And that could be black holes. And what, what you also find is that if you have a big galaxy with a big, you know, like uh, an elliptical galaxy like M87, the one I'm going to talk about, it will have a big black hole, a big, big dark object of uh, billions of solar masses in the center. If you go to a galaxy like our Milky Way, uh, you'll have something like million solar masses, factor 1,000 difference. So small galaxies, small black holes, big galaxies, big black holes. Why do I mention the two? If you want to go for the biggest and closest black holes, these are the two galaxies to look for. Because M87 is the closest of the really, really big galaxies. And the closest of the normal galaxies, of course, are our own, the Milky Way. And so that's where you have to look. Now, if you look at the Milky Way, this is an image of, uh, of the Milky Way in optical light. You see dust where which stars form. Uh, if you go to a near infrared image, you can actually peer through the dust. You look to the center of the galaxy, and you see it's full of stars. Millions of stars where we have one star. I mean, around our, galaxy, our own sun, there would be a million stars where there is no one. Our night sky would be completely different. If you look into the center, what you see is that the stars in the very center, they move. In fact, they move. The latest paper I just saw was with a star which moves up with 30,000 kilometers per second. OK, 30,000 kilometers per second. Um, and they actually go in orbits, uh, in elliptical orbits. And they have been measured with an instrument called gravity. Uh, it's an interferometer combining the telescopes of ESO. Um, and uh, you see here the measurements over uh, more than 16 years of, of the 16-year orbit. Um, and you see very, very nice, beautiful ellipse. It, it moves like a planet around the sun in a more extreme orbit, of course, uh, slightly inclined as, as we see it. You, this one moves with more than 10,000 kilometers per second. And, from, and then you have to ask yourself, OK, how can something move on an ellipse with 10,000 kilometers per second? How much? What, what force is necessary to keep it on that orbit? How much mass is, ne is needed? How much gravity is needed? And what you find is you need 4 million solar masses in that point to explain the orbit of this, uh, of, of, of this star. All of this uh, in one orbit, in, in one star, which you don't really see. Well, you do see it in the radio, because radio also goes through the dust. And this here is a beautiful image. Um, of, uh, made by the Meerkat Array in South Africa, pathfinder of the Square Kilometer Array. Beautiful one, showing the center of our Milky Way. It's blowing bright uh, in radio emission. You have uh, supernova explosions here. You have the, the center of the, milk, uh, the, the, the galactic plane. You have magnetic filaments. Um, and this here is Sagittarius A, um, the center of the Milky Way, a star that exploded 40,000 years ago. Um, relatively recent in uh, cosmic history, and that marks the very center. And if you zoom further in, you see this uh, uh, spiral here of gas, which actually rotates around the center. And then in the very, very center, you see a tiny radio source, where a lot of radio emission comes from a very, very small region. And that's called Sagittarius A star. Apologies for the name, but that's how we, do astro we astronomers do our naming, Sagittarius A star. 
um, because it said it's a bright radio source in Sagittarius and the star because it's a very exciting source. Okay, that's, that's how it got the star. Um, it's very small. It was always suspected to be, you know, that might be the very, very center of the Milky Way. It turns out this was found in 74. And uh, when they measured the stars uh, in the near infrared um, 20 years later, turns out all the stars orbit around that particular radio source. So that may be the central supermassive black hole of all Milky Way. This is one of the galaxies. This is one of the sources we look at. We have not published the results of this one yet. The other galaxy we're talking about is M87. Uh, that's not our galaxy, but it's a big one, and it's 55 million light years away. Um, and what you see here is uh, an optical image. You see it's a big fluffy thing, but these are 1,000 billion uh, uh, stars in this uh, almost uh, spherical configuration. When you look here, you see this little streak of light. That was actually already found in 1918 by Heber Curtis. A little streak of light. Uh, people didn't know that, uh, that this was a galaxy at the time even, and they certainly didn't know that this was a relatively a plasma jet, very, very hot plasma shooting out from the center of this galaxy with almost the speed of light. Um, but that's what it was, and it actually was telling us, please look here, because I'm coming from a black hole. Uh, but it took us you know, 60, 80 years to find out that actually that was a message uh, it was giving us. But it actually was found just a few years after Einstein developed general relativity. So within a few years, everything was known. It just you have to put things together, and that took a long time. If you look at the radio, you see that this jet actually you know, really shoots out from the very center, and it fills an entire bubble. What you see here is an image taken with LOFAR, and you know, Ireland is part of the LOFAR array. It's sort of a, uh, a, a big radio array uh, spanning all of Europe. Um, and you see this is a big bubble of uh, 100,000, uh, more than 100,000 light years um, across that uh, is just filled coming all from a tiny region in the very center of the Milky Way. Now, when I was working on the galactic center in the 90s, I was realizing that some part of the emission would come from very close to the event horizon. Uh, that was just a theory was predicting that if there's a black hole, there's radio emission, if you go to high enough radio frequencies, around millimeter wavelengths, 230 gigahertz, that emission would come from the black hole. And I was thinking, ah, okay, uh, how would it look like? How would a black hole look like at the time? And I was not looking at the paper of 1966. I was looking at a paper that came, came later. And in fact, first I was thinking, okay, if I calculate how big the, the, the black hole is, it was pretty small, okay? It was just too small to be seen with the technology I could imagine for the future. But then I was looking at this old paper from 73, and then I realized, oh, wait, something else happens around a black hole. And people had calculated that already. Uh, of course, light is being bent, okay? And that actually means that light will also um, the black hole will actually amplify itself. Well, let's briefly look at this, what, what this means. Um, so here you see light pass around a rotating black hole. Light goes in, and then actually here, space and time, will, space will actually rotate with the black hole because the black hole is rotating, and the light is deflected. It has to follow, actually, the rotating space and will enter here. Here you have a light ray, which would go normally straight, but then it will actually go around the black hole and escape here in this direction. So it will end up somewhere completely differently. And if you go close enough, this one will go around and end up in the event horizon. Um, so um, this is how light will behave. And in fact, as I said, this was already discovered much earlier in 1916 by, by David Hilbert, describing how black holes would uh, deflect light. Um, and so this is a critical point. You have a light ray coming in, it will actually deflect it, and will end here on what's called the photon orbit. Uh, what this means is light will go in, it will go on infinitely, infinitely, uh, in, for, for all, for, in all eternity, uh, on a circle. Um, so you go in, and you just rotate and keep rotating. It will never escape. That's just mathematical, right? Uh, because it means if it's getting a little bit too close, it will actually end up in the event horizon. If, it, if it's a little bit too far, it will escape to, 
uh, to infinity. And so that's a very special region. If you would stand here around a black hole uh, on this circle, uh, let, let's you know, show this here, you stand on this circle, you would actually see yourself uh, in front of you. Okay? Of course, it takes a while to go around, so you would see yourself in front of you uh, like three weeks ago or two weeks ago, okay, if the black hole is large enough. So that'd be an interesting sight to see. Um, of course, it's a short pleasure because, you know, you'll actually plunge into the black hole pretty soon, so. Uh, but at least imagine the, the fun, okay. Um, but it means that all light that enters from here to here will actually disappear. And we are calculating this, and the prediction was, uh, of the model was, that the black hole would actually be surrounded by something like a, a glowing fog of radio emission at these high frequencies. It would be emitted very close and would be optically thin, like a transparent fog. Um, and uh, well, what you see? Well, some light would, would disappear. You see this here. You would see this dark region here. Um, and we call that the shadow. In fact, that term came actually in our 2000 paper. Before that, it was just a hole or whatever. We call it the shadow. Um, because you know, if you call it the black hole, it's not the black hole. It's actually the light that's missing. So it really is what you do not see that is that significant. Okay, this is one of the cases where you know what you not see is actually important. It's the light that disappears in the black hole. Uh, and then around it, you see this this ring here, uh, which to a large fraction comes from light going around once or actually just half time. Lots of light is focused towards that ring that I was just describing, and it will actually be one sided. You know, in this case, because here we're assuming that the matter is rotating around the black hole. And matter that's moving with almost the speed of light towards you will be amplified in terms of radiation, and the light that moves away from you will be de-amplified. And so uh, that will be the signature of rotating with almost the speed of half the speed of light, say, around a black hole that you'd see have a ring and the light bending. And it also turned out that the size of that shadow would be almost independent of all astrophysical assumptions and would be proportional to the mass of the black hole. So if you know the mass of a black hole, you can predict how big the shadow should be uh, to a very good accuracy to within 5%, even independent of whether it's rotating or not. And so we made the prediction in 2000 that if you can build a interferometer uh, using a technique called very long baseline interferometry to resolve this, at that frequency, we should see that shadow for these black holes. Now, there have been previous pictures, as you mentioned. I mean, many of you have seen, seen some of those. This is actually one of the first ones was drawn in 79. They typically actually have these thin disks, and so they are intransparent. So what you see here is not a shadow. You see actually a hole in the accretion disk, and you see uh, you know, absorption by the rest. And that significantly modifies this. And that is not how we picture those uh, low power black holes that I'm talking about. But of course, this is what you see in the movies, you know, this Hollywood movie. Um, um, in fact, you know, black hole would not look like this. I'm trying to, you know, hammer that, that picture home. Um, it's slowly changing uh, because, you know, what you see here in these predictions, we gave it a certain color, okay? This is orange, red, not because, you know, I'm working for the Netherlands, but actually it's supposed to to uh, uh, radiate, sort of, to transport the, the picture of heat, okay? This is a prediction for radio emission, and radio emission doesn't have a color. It's actually very red light, so to speak, very, very red light. Um, but in order to translate it into a color, you have to give it, you know, some color scale, and we gave it in that prediction a red color scale. Uh, and so that's what people adopted at some point, at least, and also in the observation, so the, the final picture you'll see will have the same color scale because of the, of the prediction. Uh, and, but now at least NASA also, you know, it doesn't change the astrophysical model, but at least it changes the color now if you look at this. So that's, um, of course we do better models now. Uh, this is a simulation I show here, which is, you know, uh, tuned for public consumption, but actually contains enormous amount of physics. It's actually a, a, a uh, three-dimensional, okay, this is a virtual reality, general relativistic ray tracing, three-dimensional GR, general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic simulation. Okay, I have to explain all of this. Uh, this is hydrodynamics, this is a plasma flow in the curved space-time of a black hole. 
This is where the H stands for. It's magnetized. That's what the M stands for. It's three-dimensional. We really do three-dimensional simulations. We do ray tracing. The RT stands for ray tracing. We follow the rays uh, throughout space-time, and we follow absorption and emission of those. And of course, again, this is in, in, in curved space-times. In fact, in all space-times you can think of, we made a, you know, we, we, we developed simulations which can run for Schwarzschild black holes, but also for alternatives. You know, if you have an alternative theory of black holes or something completely crazy, you can run it through the simulation pipeline and can run your own images. Uh, and then, you know, you have the plasma flow flowing in and you calculate the radiation. And you put this all together and you let it evolve in also virtual reality. That's what the VR stands for. And you see here how uh, the, the, the plasma rotates around. This is actually you know, close to the speed of light. It's very turbulent. It's very fluffy, very hot emission, very tenuous emission as well. Uh, and from the center, if you, look, if you go back here to the, uh, the simulation, you see this jet shooting out. This is where magnetic fields actually making a slingshot effect at the very in inner edge and shooting out plasma uh, also with the speed of light. And in the very center, you see this dark region in this, you know, in this bright ring of light in this ball of fire, um, ball of fire, you actually see this dark region, and that is again the shadow. Okay, you always see this dark region there. Now this shows actually simulation for all frequencies at once, you know, all colors, so to speak, all radio colors at once. But you can target certain you know, frequencies, and depending on what frequency you, you target, you see different things. For example, if you go to the model of M87, this is actually a paper that you know, we published together with Monika moshi who is now an assistant professor in our university, um, of M87. This was a simulation uh, from 2016. If you focus on a frequency of 86 gigahertz, this is three millimeter wavelengths, what you see mainly is the jet flowing out. And you actually see the outer edge of the jet shooting out. You see, barely you see the shadow. You see this dark ring here. This is from absorption. Again, this is absorbing uh, region. But you mainly see jet. Now, if you go to a higher frequency, you go just a f frequency three times higher, 230 gigahertz. As I said, the prediction, you know, this back on the envelope model we made in the 2000s was you'd go to, slower and, uh, to smaller and smaller wavelengths, uh, smaller and smaller frequencies and smaller scales. Sorry, smaller wavelengths, smaller scales. And that's what happens here. The same model, just at a higher frequency, all the emission is concentrated in the innermost region where it's strongly affected by that light bending effect. And all that light is sort of scrambled around. It goes on sort of in this, uh, this uh, uh, merry-go-round, so to speak, around the black hole, goes into this ring, and that's, that was a prediction. Uh, a bright ring with a dark shadow in the center and one-sided on, on one side. And that was published a year before we made those observations. Uh, the angular width on the sky is 40 micro arc seconds. Well, that's for the astronomers among you who know what an arc second is. Uh, suffice to say, this is uh, the size of a mustard seed in New York as seen here from Dublin. Okay. So it's a very small region and you'd have to see a hole in that, in that mustard seed. In order to see that, you need to have a telescope of a certain size. The larger the telescope, the bigger the resolution. The better the resolution, the sharper your view. And at that frequency, you need a telescope the size of the Earth, okay, to see that. You need a telescope the size of the Earth, and we built one. So, um, of course, it started. This actually is a technology that was known before. You can actually build a telescope by coupling telescopes which are separated and putting them together. Um, it was done at lower wavelengths, at, at, at uh, lower frequencies before, and we had to do it at higher frequencies. This here is the first experiment looking at the center of the Milky Way. It was done here in Europe with uh, uh, Spain and France uh, in, in the late 90s already, just two telescopes combined. This is not good enough to make any images. Uh, then in the 2000s, there was an American triangle uh, in California, Arizona, and, and Hawaii with some European participation as well. But in order to make an image, you need to have more telescopes around the world and uh, you, yeah, you, need, you need to be, have more telescopes around the world. And that's what we did in this global campaign in 2017. 
These were eight telescopes on six different mountains. Why mountains? Because at these sh short wavelengths, um, you are affected by humidity in the air, uh, clouds and, uh, and, and whatnot. So you have to go high in order to have dry air, um, less clouds, and you need perfect weather all around the world. Okay, of course that never happens. Um, but it did happen in 2017 for the first time. And that's when we did our very first experiment. Uh, here in Spain, uh, Mexico, Chile, South Pole, Arizona, and, and Hawaii. The data will then be brought to, together uh, back and correlated in, in correlation centers in Haystack and Bonn where the data is then combined. Uh, we had one week of observations in April uh, 5 to 11, 2017. Uh, we observed six nights, and as I said, we had beautiful weather. It was just amazing. You know, I, I used to have a reputation. When I, when I got here, you know, you said, oh, what kind of weather do you bring along, right? So usually when I go tele to a telescope, that's what people say, okay. But somehow my, my miracle, my magic didn't work, and the weather was good. Um, my, my negative magic didn't work. Uh, we record the data at the telescope, so we are recording five petabit of, 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 of data. Uh, we do this on hard drives. Uh, this here is a hard drive rack. I, you know, it, it shakes because I was shaking at this altitude. Um, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't the wine. It wasn't the Spanish wine. You know, it's, um, this, is, uh, this is a box which you can take out. It contains eight hard drives. It's just a rack. You know, we take out these, uh, these hard drives here, and you can ship them. We actually record the data with 32 gigabits per second, now 64 gigabits per second, and we ship it then to a central point where the, where the data is all uh, combined. We have an atomic clock uh, at each station, which actually time tags the data, um, and uh, so that we can later combine them exactly in phase at the right time. These are the telescopes here that you see. Uh, this here is Mexico. This is Hawaii, this is Arizona, uh, South Pole, Chile, Spain. Actually, they, everywhere was a mixed team. In fact, from, from Nijmegen, we had uh, almost everywhere a representative in the team, uh, except for South Pole. Problem with South Pole is um, you have to stay overnight, and that night lasts six months. You know, it's uh, so very unpleasant. So you need, you need a special crew. I was in Spain, uh, well, it was this funny guy here. Um, I would say because of the good food, you know, actually the best food you get actually in, in Spain at this, this telescope. Um, and uh, yeah, this, this is a crew in Chile here. This is Chiriaco Gotti from, from our institute. This was the before the observation picture. This was the after the observation picture. <laughs> it, was, it, was a, uh, it was very tiring. Um, this is how it worked. Uh, this is a live display that we had. Uh, you see here the sources moving over the Earth. Actually, the Earth is moving underneath uh, the, the sources. Uh, and you see, when I come in, into sight for the telescopes, we try to observe with as many telescopes as possible. And these connections, essentially, which are virtual connections, give us information about the sources. You see, we're switching us from M87 to other sources, quasars 3C273 and 279. These were the first quasars ever detected. We still use them as calibrators. And all our calibration, we did on the calibrators first before we looked at the data from M87, just not to fool ourselves. Okay? We, we kept it uh, you know, closed, the data on M87, first looked at the calibrators. And then you make images. How do you make images? Well, as I said, uh, the connections are important. <coughs> Uh, and in fact, uh, here, this would be a long collection from, connection from South Pole to, um, uh, to Spain. Um, and essentially, it works like a, a double slit experiment. Uh, you, you have a plane wave coming in. You record the waves at two different locations. And then you let them interfere. This is like you're throwing a, two rocks into a pond. Okay? You create waves. And when the waves interfere with each other, you see interesting patterns. And depending on where you throw the rocks, the patterns, interference patterns will change. And from that, you get information about the separation of the rocks and uh, the, uh, the orientation of that separation. Now, if you do this, you combine the waves from two different telescopes, you get something like this called the fringe pattern. You just get sort of this, this fringe pattern. That's not yet an image. Uh, but it gives you some structural information. If you have more connections, uh, you actually get more and more wave patterns and if you have the Earth rotating and probing different directions, different separations, 
you suddenly get structural information about the object that we're observing. In this case, it was a teapot, okay. So this was just to show that Russell's teapot can be seen after all. So, um, and uh, well, it's just a simulation, but you know, you see it's not a perfect image because we are missing information. We don't have telescopes everywhere, but it's good enough to see the basic shape. And that's what you need to understand. There's always a limit of what you can see. You know, with few telescopes, this is only a limit. We worked on this, and I'll say in a, in a moment how we did this. Um, and we worked on this you know, for three quarters of a year, very hard, and different teams checking over and over again with a big group of people doing this imaging and calibrating the data until this famous moment of April 10, when we showed that in actually various press conferences. This was the one in Brussels. There was one in Washington as well. These were the two main uh, press conferences. There was one in Taiwan and Japan as well in Chile. Uh, this was streamed because this is a global project and people were present everywhere. We did it, of course, in Brussels because we had a strong European support that we wanted to acknowledge. Um, and in fact, it was an amazing, amazing experience, that press conference. Um, and uh, you know, I was showing that video to reveal that image. It was timed around the world, like seven minutes after three, we would show that image. And so that, that was a video that we showed, and I'll, I'll show that now again. Uh, we zoom into the center of M87, the first galaxy that we observed. As I said, the Milky Way is still to come. And uh, now this actually has music from my son who's making film music, so that's why it has sound. Um, I hope it works. Yes, it does. It's not very loud here. Um, so this is, a, as I said, a zoom over a factor of a billion. And uh, shaky. Um, so the first thing, and, and all you see are real images of uh, and so we're zooming into, we saw the low far image, we saw the optical image, and now we see the jet. We're going to higher and higher frequencies and we're seeing more and deeper and, and then in the end somehow the sound wasn't as good, but okay. The, uh, that's what we see in the end. So as you saw before, it's completely different from everything we'd seen before. And these, these, these jets we saw before, you know, every time we went to a higher and higher frequency, we were always seeing jets, jet, jet, jet. But once we get, got to this magic frequency, which just happens to be magic, 230 gigahertz, just by coincidence, um, of the astrophysics, we see that ring. It looks completely different. But it looks exactly as we predicted it, with the dark region, the shadow, and the one-sided ring at this location. Um, if you look at the, the size of this, it's 100 billion kilometers, if you know what a kilometer is. Um, and this, this would be sort of this lens photon ring. The event horizon would have that size, and this would be the orbit of Neptune. Right? This is how far Voyager has come. So this is really larger than our planetary solar system than the planets are, that, that black hole. It's really, really enormous. Uh, there were some questions about how big that black hole is in, initially, and it really settled now on, on being really, really big. Um, and, you know, and also, you know, the, the thing that really makes me shiver every time I think about it, you know, this is light going around the black hole. And if you look in here, in this dark region, which actually is not completely dark, here it's actually blacked out. Um, but in the or original image, it's not completely, it's, it's a shadow, so it's not completely dark, okay? It's, it's, but what you see there, if you look in there, the light that you see actually, your light path will end up in the event horizon. You know, some emission in the foreground, but if you look through this, you're actually looking really into the throat of that beast. And that makes it so, so amazing. And I think, I think that was caught by, by almost everybody was looking at it. And so this was really, really, you know, front page news around the world, really. Uh, all continents, there are studies which said, you know, four and a half billion people were actually looking at that, at, at, at that news and that, that, those images. Um, this was just far beyond anything we had expected. Uh, social media went crazy. <laughs> so it's, uh, what, what Brexit looks like from space. Theresa May was still, I mean, you may remember she was actually big news before, after, but on that day, we actually were front page news on BBC for a couple of hours before above Brexit. There were also so more nice uh, other things. We got the breakthrough 
um, breakthrough prize last year. We got the Einstein medal this year, the breakthrough of the year. But the nicest thing is, that picture is now, we got a letter from the Rijksmuseum. If you know, this is where uh, the night watch is and so forth. And so they actually included that picture in their photo collection. So, and also the Museum, Museum of Modern Art. So uh, the MoMA in New York actually has it now included. So actually this is where science meets, meets art, which is nice. Of course, how do we know uh, this is the right interpretation? Well, we did our best, okay. We used three different techniques. These are, you know, these are diff three different names of imaging techniques to reduce the data. We had two independent calibration teams uh, calibrating the data. We, we started with four teams that were not allowed to talk to each other independently doing this uh, and then combining the data. We had image challenges before where we tried uh, the data on different simulated data to, to verify that the technique would work. We also did the same thing at, at four different days. We had four different days where we observed and every time we got the same answer. And, and so whatever we did, in the end we came to that conclusion. Uh, what we also did is we did big simulations. Um, uh, this here is one uh, supercomputer simulation of light uh, from this going around the black hole. You see that, that ring here. You see the plasma. And, uh, and this, this we did for, um, we, we did 60,000 images of black holes, essentially. This is the biggest library of, of simulated black holes. And all of them actually all show that shadow as, as we did sort of you know, 20 years ago with that ring uh, and, and that dark region. And that we use that to test, you know, check our uncertainties and, and systematic errors and test our calibration pipeline. Uh, that, what, that's what you see here. On the right, you see a model. Uh, and then we pipe it through a simulation pipeline which simulates a VOB observation, you know, because we have a finite resolution. And what you see here is if the, 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 the movie has perfect resolution, uh, if you smear it with the resolution we have, it looks pretty much like what we, uh, what we observe. So the, the predicted black hole image is indistinguishable from the one that we measure. So to be scientifically correct, what we say is we cannot rule out uh, that Einstein's theory of gravity is perfectly correct in this case, right? You can never prove something in science. You can never rule it out. And so um, that test, uh, Einstein's theory, you know, passes with flying colors. We can do a few other things. So just quickly, we measure the size of this. The size here was, uh, well, the answer to the size, of course, was known before. It was 42. It was 42 <laughs> micro arc seconds. Um, <laughs> Uh, and if you translate that, you can translate it into a mass, as I said, if you know the distance, and it was six and a half billion uh, times the mass of the sun, which was coincident with the measurements based on stars, uh, from the kinematics of stars. Uh, what's also interesting in is, is, you know, um, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, gravitation waves were measured for the first time directly from the merger of two objects the size of 60, so, uh, 30 solar mass objects which were merging into a 60 solar mass object. And the idea that were that these are black holes. And these gravitation waves are produced at the same region as this light ring is produced, right? So if you hear gravitational waves, um, you hear the photon orbit ring, so to speak. And if you see a black hole, you see the photon orbit, so to speak. And so we're probing more or less the same regions small black holes and supermassive black holes. You know, for these, these really big ones, this, you know, what we have is, I think, the best evidence for the existence of supermassive black holes by now. Um, and uh, the prediction is that the scale where the gravitational waves are made and the scale of this orbit is proportional to the mass, as I said. But the mass here is different by a factor of 100 million. Okay, so the same theory, you just change you know, it's the same theory. You just change the mass by a factor of 100 million. It's, it perfectly predicts both, uh, both effects. I think that's a wonderful uh, confirmation of the theory and, and the scale invariance of, of uh, black holes. Now, I see I have to uh, skip a little bit. Now, well, it's, now I have some, some pictures. We want to expand what we want to do in the future. Um, this is a telescope in France. The, um, uh, the Noema array. 
And it just feels, you know, I, I was visiting it two years ago, and it just feels like James Bond, right? You're, you're flying up the mountains, and then you suddenly see these structures appear on, on, on the mountaintop, and you're expecting the evil guy sitting there. Uh, and, um, and these are 15-meter dishes, which are all co combined into one dish, and we'll actually use it in April for the first time. We'll use that to make another experiment combined with all the other telescopes. And this big hall there actually hosts you know, two or three of these big 15-meter dishes. It's just enormous uh, and amazing to, to be there. Um, interestingly, the same dish um, is actually standing idle right now in Chile. And we have enough telescopes in Chile, but we don't have any telescope in Africa. So one of my dreams is that we get one of these dishes and we put it into Africa, and ideally, we have, we've been working uh, with the you know, University of Namibia and the people in Namibia to actually get this to the Gamsberg Mountain, which is uh, 100 kilometers west of, of Windhoek, uh, to make a better network. And it's just an amazing mountain there, 2,300 meters high, totally flat area. It actually is property of the German Max Planck Society, which bought it for telescopes, but never was really used. Um, so it's actually uh, available. And uh, we, we try to do this um, uh, together with people there. You have an amazing view. We also couple it to an outreach program. Um, so we now have shipped a mobile planetarium to, uh, to Namibia because we use that in the Netherlands to go to all the schools to show them sort of the night sky and explain that to them. And here we are teaming up with a local NGO which goes to all the schools in Namibia. And they do uh, um, something on desert research and so forth. Uh, but then now we'll, you know, we'll, we'll be doing t teaching astronomy as well, these, these primary schools and, and, and high schools actually all around the country uh, to get people involved. In the long run, uh, we want to go into, um, into space. The Earth is not enough. Uh, if you want to get higher resolution, you need to have a telescope larger than the Earth. And here the idea is to have three spacecrafts going around the Earth at slightly different orbits which means they will orbit together but slightly and slowly drift apart. They will change the orientation, so you get all orientations and you get all separations with time. So depending on the orbital separation within a week or in a month, you get actually all separations and, and, and orientations covered. And then if you look at the top row, this is what you can go get in from the ground. This is a simulated image of the center of the Milky Way. This is what you could get from the ground. A limited resolution. If you go to a higher frequency, uh, the emission will be much more concentrated. This is an average model of the variability. And this is what you can get from space um, with a, you know, even a small dishes. If you make bigger dishes, you get, you, it get, gets even, uh, even better. Uh, and so you get really see, see the, the sharp wisps here and uh, going around, you see the, the shadow in, in great detail. So this, this you can use to make real movies of, of black holes uh, and see them like, uh, like in Hollywood. So, let me conclude. The Event Horizon Telescope has seen a black hole shadow. A black hole, as an S too many. Uh, size, shape, structure, everything fits the prediction of general relativity, which means that the object has to be smaller than the photon orbit. Okay? But of all practical purposes, that's a black hole. And I think that's the best evidence we have, the tightest constraint on supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies, which were predict predicted for quasars based on very simple arguments. We now look in great detail, and we see their shadow. We also see that GR works over eight orders of magnitude. It's just amazing how that theory works, and that's a very tough thing to do for some other alternative theories. And that shadow, if you think about it, really is a co the consequence of the light bending around a black hole and the absorption in the event horizon. You're really looking into the event horizon at this region. Um, and that's how f at as far as we can get, okay? With our today's knowledge of science, we get to this event horizon, but we're not getting any further, okay? So there is a part of the universe that we can know is there, but we cannot study the inside, fundamentally not study the inside. And it takes a very, very radical change in physics to ever look into the inside. And it, you know, it's a big question whether that will ever happen. I'm not entirely convinced this will happen. So the question is, you know, what is science then inside a black hole? You know, is that still science or is it meta, meta, metaphysics? 
We'll keep on going. We'll try to see whether we see any changes. We we'll try to make more and sharper images, more epochs, we'll try to make movies, get higher frequencies. We have a telescope in Greenland coming online in France, hopefully Africa, if, if I find the funding, still struggling to find the funding. Um, and we'll have a lot of fun in the future. You know, these, these two sources will stay around for generations of students to study and uh, test GR as precise as we can we can imagine. It's just a question of how far out do we go with our spacecraft? You know, how big do we make our telescopes? And the sky is our limit, really. Uh, I'm curious how, how it will look like black holes in thousand, thousand years. It would probably be an amazing view. Thank you. <laughs>